The stigma of mental illness, indeed one of the last taboos in our Canadian society. Why is it that we can talk about any body part or orifice, but when it comes to mental illness, it's generally with shame and humiliation? And yet, most of us know someone who has been touched by mental illness. In fact, one in five Canadians today lives with a mental illness. The Somerville family has been touched significantly and deeply by mental illness. There's a lot of sad stories I could tell you today, but I won't go into all of them. But first of all, uh, seven of my mother's seven children have or had struggles with mental health problems and mental illnesses. I can remember when I was a little boy that she used to say, I don't know why my kids struggle with depression when I'm the one that went through the Great Depression. And some of you will understand that. She was a woman of great resiliency and a great sense of humor. She was the mental and spiritual health glue of the family. Uh, to begin with, my father struggled with a bipolar disorder and alcoholism, and he eventually took his life by suicide. And then I had another brother who also struggled with bipolar disorder and alcoholism, and we're not sure, but he probably also took his life by suicide. And then I have a brother who's a Vietnam veteran and who lives in a horrible residential home. There's not much I can do for him because he's down in the States and I'm here doing my work, and it's very hard to advocate across the border. And as a Vietnam veteran, he became hooked on marijuana, and that led to drug-induced psychosis, leading to full-blown schizophrenia. And then I have another brother who's rather successful, and yet he struggles periodically with bouts of panic attacks. And then there's my twin sister, Kathy, and uh, she struggles with depression, but otherwise she's on the road to recovery as, as well. And I myself have struggled as well with mental health problems, and... Uh, such things as suicidal ideation, uh, major clinical depression, depersonalization, derealization. Um, I think I mentioned suicidal ideation as well. And some of those symptoms today would be associated with dissociative identity disorder or psychosis. It's not easy going crazy. It's not easy being crazy. It's one of the most scary, painful experiences in my life that I've ever had. And yet the numbers are staggering in Canada. One in 100 people will have some form of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. One in seven children today will be diagnosed with a mental health problem. One in five girls has an eating disorder problem. And then you, when you look at people in long-term personal care homes, did you realize that up to 75% live with a diagnosable mental health problem? And then when we look at Canada's largest mental health asylum, and that's what I call it, a mental health asylum, and that's our correctional system. Did you realize that up to 25% of inmates have a mental illness? So you say, Chris, what is a mental illness? Well, a mental illness is a disorder in which you have difficulty with your thinking, your believing, your sensing, your perceiving, your acting, and your behaving, and your communicating. So much so that it interrupts your living, your learning, your loving, and playing. That's why it's called a mental disorder, because it creates so much disorder in your life. But you know what? If you're going to have a mental illness, today's the best day to have a mental illness. And you say, good grief, Chris. <laughs> that sounds so odd. That sounds rather crazy, and it might be. But we know more than ever before what helps people to get better and to stay better. We know the kind of community supports and services that help people to be able to live in the community successfully. And so mental illnesses are treatable, and recovery is possible. The treatments, as you know, are medication, psychiatric rehabilitation, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, other psychological support services, even self-help helps, as well as mindfulness, good spirituality, healthy spirituality, and even good nutrition. All of these foster recovery. And talking about recovery, that's one of my most exciting passions, because I really want to see a recovery-oriented mental health system in Canada. Recovery is a powerful word, but it's an even more powerful experience. And I have seen hundreds, if not thousands, of people at the Manitoba Schizophrenia Society for the last 20 years journey the road of recovery. And what is recovery? Recovery is simply learning to live beyond the limitations of the mental illness. Recovery is, in spite of symptoms, whether you have symptoms or not, enjoying a satisfying, meaningful life. Even though it's not necessarily a cure, recovery and at the end of the day is simply having a quality of life. But the bad news is that most people who struggle with mental health problems and mental illnesses don't get help because of the stigma and the social prejudice. Up to two-thirds of people, two-thirds of people struggling with mental health problems and illnesses 
don't get the help that they need. And when they choose to do so, most of the time they cannot get the help immediately. Case in point, if you live in Toronto, it'll take you about a year to see a psychiatrist. So there are wait times and wait lists and waiting on timely and appropriate services and waiting on housing and waiting on decent income. Tell that to the 75 people at Selkirk Mental Health Center here in Manitoba who do not have a private room, some for decades. Those 75 people live in barrack-like hall dormitories. How unfortunate to have something like a mental illness and yet not to have any privacy, some for decades, as I said. And then there are those who are on a waiting list to be released back into the community. They're not sick enough to be at Selkirk Mental Health Center, but some have been there up to three years. They can't go home, why? Because there's either not the housing or the appropriate community supports and services that would enable them to live successfully in the, in the community. And talking about psychological support services, up to 70% of people with mental illnesses, severe mental illnesses, have unresolved trauma issues. And did you realize that psychological support services are not covered by Medicare? And then let's talk about income security, or rather income insecurity, as I call it. If you're disabled by a mental illness, well, you might be able to draw up to $775 a month. And then if you're lucky, you might be able to find an apartment for $500 a month in Winnipeg. And that leaves you only what? You've done the math, $275 to live on. Even though we don't know what causes mental illnesses exactly, we know what triggers the onset of mental illness. We know what triggers the relapse and the rehospitalization, and it's the S word, stress. It's got to be pretty stressful living on $275 a month. That's why some people say that have a mental illness that it's more difficult to live with the stigma and the social prejudice than the mental illness itself. Because you see, the harm of stigma is more than skin deep. When the Senate committee was doing its research that eventually led to the creation of the Mental Health Commission of Canada, one woman testified before the Senate committee, and she lived with bipolar disorder, and here's what she said to the committee. I would rather have breast cancer than bipolar disorder because of the stigma that I have to live with every day. Realize that people with enduring mental illnesses die earlier than the rest of us. In fact, those people with severe and persistent mental illnesses die 20 to 25 years earlier than the rest of us. Premature death, simply because their physical illnesses are not taken care of or because they're struggling with cardiovascular or metabolic illnesses. Stigma also leads to lower rates of employment. While 70% of people with severe mental illnesses would like to work or have meaningful activity, only 10 to 15% are employed because of the stigma once again. So people are trapped in holes, trapped in the hole of mental illness, trapped in the hole of homelessness, trapped in the hole of being unemployed, or if they have a home, trapped in a shabby home. It's not something that you would necessarily put on your resume. The seven-year-old Mental Health Commission of Canada, of which I was a board member for six years, in the year 2011, released Canada's first ever national mental health strategy. And we were so proud that finally, Canada of the G8 countries was finally had a national mental health strategy because we were the only G8 country that didn't have a national mental health strategy. And in that strategy, there was a recommendation that the government of Canada increase spending on mental health care from seven to nine percent over a 10 year period. Now we know we got that wrong, that it should have been more like 12 percent. But to date, the federal government has not responded. There is not that political will to do the right thing, to increase funding, to increase community supports and services. And then too, provincial and territorial governments have produced their own mental health strategies, and they too are waiting, waiting on the government of Ottawa for more political funding, or rather funding. So there is no political will to do the right thing, to do the justice thing. And you say, well, Chris, why is there no political will? Because there's no social will. Why is there no social will? Because of the social prejudice and the discrimination. And that's why I believe that this is not just a mere health issue. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't see it as a mere health issue. But we must come to see it as a social justice issue. And again, you say, well, Chris, why a social justice issue? 
because as I said earlier, knowing more than ever before what helps people to get better and stay better, knowing that timely and appropriate treatment options help people to recover, knowing that community supports and services, if they're there, help people to live successfully in the, the community. We know how to avoid relapse and, and rehospitalization. And yet being the wealthiest country in the world, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, and not to provide those community supports and treatments, that is a social injustice issue. You see, people with psychiatric disabilities deserve the right to thrive and not just survive. Why? Because human rights are about respecting the dignity, the worth, the sanctity, and the worthwhileness of every person regardless of their disability or diagnosis. Unfortunately, the goal of the mental health system seems to be, in too many cases, merely symptom reduction. Take a pill. And the pill hardly gives you everything that you need. The goal of the mental health system, along with housing and justice and other departments, departments and services, should be that of enhancing people's quality of life, really just fostering recovery. And what are people recovering from? People are recovering from the mental illness itself, they're recovering from the side effects of medication. They're recovering from the public stigma. They're recovering from self-stigma, recovering perhaps from learned helplessness and hopelessness. They're recovering from lack of decent housing, recovering from lack of adequate income. And all are recovering from a mental health system that is not recovery oriented. And so we're just told to wait. Wait times, wait lists, waiting on community supports and services, et cetera, et cetera. Just wait. That reminds me of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. I was 10 years old in 1963 when Dr. King came to Birmingham and was engaging in nonviolent protest to end racism and segregation. And he was thrown in the Birmingham jail. And... Uh, and also, I remember the marching Ku Klux Klan and the biting police dogs and the piercing fire hoses and the angry mobs. And yet, Dr. King was thrown in jail for his nonviolent protest. And a group of clergymen, all white, pled with him, Dr. King, just wait. Just wait a while. Wait a little longer. Stop these protests, even though they're nonviolent. And somehow or another, we'll get this thing together and we'll work with you someday, you know, on this thing. And so Dr. King in the Birmingham jail, he responded to the white clergyman with a letter that's become known as the letter from a Birmingham jail. And, when I, and I would like to read a portion of it, which refers to this waiting. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. I frankly have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was well trimmed in view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I have heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. Justice delayed for people with mental illnesses, especially those that are disabled by mental illness. Delayed housing, delayed community supports and services, delayed timely and appropriate treatment. Justice delayed for them is justice denied. I'd like to tell you a story, a parable. Once upon a time, there was a man in the hole of despair and distress of mental illness. He had a mental illness and he was in the hole. And every day he would cry out, help me, somebody help me. Please, will someone come to my rescue and get me out of this hole? And one day a pastor passed by and heard his cry of distress. And the pastor stopped by and offered some wonderful counseling and then prayed a wonderful prayer and then was on his way. And again, the man in the hole of mental illness cried out, help me, will somebody please help me? And a doctor heard the cry and he stopped by. And the doctor wrote out a prescription and did some wonderful cognitive behavioral therapy and then he was on his way. And the man in the hole of mental illness continued to cry out, somebody help me out of this hole. Will somebody please help me out of this hole? And a lawyer came by. And the lawyer, well, what did he do? Well, he stopped by and he gave him his business card and he said, call me when you get out and we'll see what benefits we can get for you when you get out of this hole. 
And again, the man in the hole with mental illness continued to cry out day after day, somebody help me out of this hole. And finally, there was a person who was in recovery, in recovery from mental illness. And he heard the man's cry of distress. And you know what he did? He jumped in the hole with the man with the mental illness. And the man with the mental illness said, why did you do that? And to which the man in recovery said, because I've been where you are and I know the way out. And some of you know what I'm talking about today because you've been there and you've found the way out. The rest of you, I would call upon you, call upon you to be a helpmeet, to call upon you to see this as a social justice issue, which means that we would then try to create a social movement, to create a social movement to, to eradicate the stigma and the prejudice and to advocate for a better mental health system. In fact, not just a typical regular mental health system, but one that's truly recovery oriented, not geared towards mere symptom reduction. And so there are three questions I would like to pose to you. Here they are. Number one, who should eradicate the stigma and discrimination? Who should be an advocate for the mentally ill or those living with a mental illness? Who should create this social justice movement? Well, the answer is obvious. All of us. All of us should eradicate, advocate, and create. And how could you do that? Today you could begin, if you haven't done already, join the Mental Health Commission of Canada. Connect with Partners for Mental Health, started by former Senator Mike Kirby to help create this social movement, Partners for Mental Health. And then there are organizations like the Schizophrenia Society of Canada, the Mood Disorder Society of Canada, and the Canadian Mental Health Association of Canada, who are all looking for volunteers to help them to create this social movement. But I want to end on a personal note. And I want you to look inside yourself. And I want to encourage you to look at your own attitudes and your actions. And perhaps there's some social prejudice. There's some fear. There's some apprehension that you have towards somebody with a mental illness. And that person might be your neighbor. It might be a friend. It might be a family member. And what I would encourage you is to see a person, not a label. See a person, not a diagnosis. Ask not what illness a person has, rather ask what person the illness has. I just love that statement. And furthermore, stop believing the myths that you read in certain newspapers. I won't say which ones. And stop listening to Hollywood movies or watching the Hollywood movies as they betray people with mental illnesses, which is most of the time an error. For example, that most people with schizophrenia are violent, when in fact 97% of people living with schizophrenia never engage in acts of violence. Well, Dr. King had a dream to end racism and segregation, and we still have a long ways to go there. I have a dream to end the social prejudice and stigma associated with mental illness. I'm Chris Somerville. Will you join me in that dream? Thank you.